Um, I'm going to now uh, turn things over to um, Zachary Ray, uh, if you will come up again and uh, take us into our next section. Good morning again. Good morning. Good morning. So I introduced myself uh, as, as, a, as a native man earlier, I introduced myself as a businessman. Now I'm the executive director of California Travel Tanner Partnership. Um, uh, it's one of the largest Native American social services programs in the nation. Uh, we have 17 counties that we represent uh, in Northern California, and Lake County is uh, our central office here. Um, we are administered by the Robertson Rancheria, uh, Band of Pomo Indians, uh, and uh, we have 15 travel partners uh, in Northern California. And so we, we work with, uh, with cash aid, supportive services, but uh, a lot of our activities are in prevention and cultural activities. And so really revitalizing our language, uh, bringing a lot of our, our traditions and culture back uh, are big pieces and big components of our success. Um, and uh, one of the metrics that, really loud, uh, one of the metrics that uh, the government uses to measure success is, is, is work participation hours. And why the state of California and none of the other states in the nation have ever met their work participation rate, uh, California Travel TANF has exceeded their work participation rate for the 18 years that they've been in business. So we have uh, gone above and beyond uh, meeting all of our metrics and all of our outcomes um, and continue to service our population in Northern California. And so um, we're going to be doing some, uh, some conversation today about our, our, uh, our history here in Lake County and I want to introduce uh, some of uh, the people that will be up here with me. <coughs> So I'll let them introduce themselves. So first up is Rose. <laughs> Mahe Kate. Um, I had a lot to share and then my uncle came up in, <laughs> in the land acknowledgement and, and shared all those beautiful words. And I said to uh, my brothers and my husband, all right, let's go. Because he did a great job welcoming you here. And um, you know, so um, so I I'll say um we hen rose steel, ay lembak, a yokeobak, a kanakama olebak. Um uh, and so uh, my name is Rose Steele and I'm from Lake County and I'm from Mendocino County I'm also Hawaiian and I live in Lower Lake and I just wanted to you know welcome all of you here um, you know our when you travel here your ancestors come with you and they meet our ancestors here and that was part of the tapestry that you brought with you is that physically physical something you brought but the people that you don't see came with you and they met our ancestors here and part of our tapestry are our baskets are these materials that we gather from the earth and we make to sustain life for you know in the in high school people don't like when i say i've been here for 22,000 years because it's something they don't know it's a story they've never heard it's miseducation and and so we come here to share those prayers to share who we are from this earth you know we can fix things but you have to go down deep to see what's here first and so we're a product of people that made it through an atrocity they made it through a time and we come to share our stories of resiliency and um, you know, I was on a few of the uh, work with Marvin and, and Justin on um, on these calls, and me and my husband were in Hawaii on one of the calls, and and um, you know, I'm, I'm you know we're Islander too, and and I thought of that love, that love we have for the land to invite you here and to to share with you as you go through this journey of whatever land you come from, there are original people that lived there, and they had traditions and they had healthy living before contact. And so um, we want to share some of those stories with you, and I'm going to um, pass it on. I'll just do a brief introduction and then come back to some of the, the history. Um, and I'll just say, uh, in, in my grandmother's language, uh, the Batsal language, uh, and, and that's just basically telling you that I come from the, the Eastern Pomo people. Rose is my sister. And, uh, and we've been fortunate to grow up in, you know, with loving elders and community members. And, and I want to acknowledge before I go on, um, you know, our sister Katie here too. And, and as, as indigenous people, our, our sovereignty comes through the women, comes through the women's womb. And we're not nations or tribes in, until 
that's restored again. So I want to acknowledge the, the women and, and also the, the women here. And, and that's that's how it was in the beginning and that's what we're looking to get to. But I'll let everybody introduce ourselves and then I'll start getting into uh, the 22,000 years that science will give us credit for. <laughs> Uh, good morning, my name is uh, Shea Duncan. I'm uh, Dene on my mom's side, but uh, I was born and raised here in uh, Lake County. I'm a uh, Pomo and enrolled member of Robinson Rancheria, which is right down the road. And um, um, my do, but I'm also French as well. And, and, and that's something I don't always share, but I think it's more than appropriate to share that. My, my grandmother's um, dad was a man by the name of George Gorbett. And it took me a long time, you know, I just said, Gorbit, 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 but it's actually Gorbet, right? <laughs> and so, but, but it's important that I, um, I acknowledge that history, whether uh, positive or negative, but, but, but that's a part of my, um, my lineage, and it's important, I felt like it's important that, that I share that today. So, um, like Eagle, um, just a quick disclaimer, you know, some of the information that we might share um, might be triggering, it might be um, traumatic and things like that, but I, I think it's important that you understand that our intent is not to um, make anybody feel guilty. Our intent is not to um, cause any harm or, or anything like that. It, it's, to, it's to educate. It's to um, quote unquote speak our truth. It's to be honest with you uh, about our experience and our perspective. And so um, I, I just, I'm really grateful for that opportunity to be able to do that in such a diverse crowd. So I'm going to pass it over to my friend over here. Ooh, I wasn't nervous till just now. <laughs> uh, it's a mawete. My ufat kemsel hekate. We hinke il, ya hake a koibak. Leeting book. Um, Kashaya book. Katui Kashaya Timat. We uh, Kamelai Metzat. And um, we're welcoming you. You know, in my language, I said that I'm from this place, that we're from this place, my family. And uh, I grew up on a place, um, we live in Lower Lake. And my name is Ke'il, which in our language here in Lake County, in Lower Lake, in Elam language, it means metal lark. And my grandmother gave that to me when I was a young boy. And um, I grew up on Kashaya Rancheria, if anybody's from California might know where Kashaya is on the coast. Um, so a lot of my upbringing since I was little is from the coast. Um, I've been in Lake County for about 12 years, and I was fortunate to uh, uh, be in recontact or recontact, reconnect with my family here in Lake County, and then uh, Rose uh, and I got married about eight years ago in our traditional ceremonial roundhouses mm -hmm. and in our traditional ways. We don't wear rings. We wear rings. Mm -hmm. So rings you can take off. <laughs> Y'all know what I'm talking about. But this ring you cannot take off. Anywhere you go, you're taking somebody with you. And that's what that's what marriage is. Doesn't make us all perfect and walking on water. But what it does do, it means in our way that when we commit to something, it's not just in this life, it's in the next. And so a lot of the things you're gonna hear are real the way we've been taught for thousands of years. Our ancestors' teachings weren't written down in books. They were written in our hearts. The trees, the water, we have a connection with that. And so we're going to share a little bit, and some of you may feel uncomfortable with what you're hearing. And I heard it earlier today. Sometimes you got to peel the scab off to really feel and understand, you know, and and we'll get into that. Um, my wife and I, we discuss it a lot. And when we first got on lockdown, oh, I, I have to mention this. We were talking about mothers. My mother is my hero. <laughs> my mother is a beautiful lady. 
with a beautiful spirit and her ancestors come from somewhere in Ireland or something, somewhere over in that area. Her ancestors came over on a boat. And my mother tells me she's European American. And I'm all, oh, okay, that makes sense to me. <laughs> and so I honor my mother because she's the life giver. And uh, I have to just say that. And, um, but my wife and I, we discussed it. And uh, when first COVID hit, we're like, what's, we were actually in Hawaii. And we saw the boat, you know, the, the planes and everybody with masks. And we're like, why is everybody with masks? And then the news broke out. We cut our trip short and flew back home. And they had a lockdown a few months later, and then it was all on and cracking, right? <laughs> like, everybody's on lockdown. We couldn't go nowhere. We couldn't go shopping. There was no toilet paper in the <laughs> store. Like, remember that? <laughs> and then we're, like, looking at each other over dinner, eating acorn mush that we picked from our trees. And we said, we got plenty of food, right? And then we decided, oh, my goodness. You mean America is going to really realize and discover what our, our African-American brothers and sisters went through, what the Southern American people went through, and what the indigenous people, have, what we have gone through for centuries? You can't go nowhere? Your families are dying because somebody breathed on them? So, we finally we're able to understand that trauma and uh, be able to know that you might understand it as well. So um, with that, we all decided that <laughs> we're gonna stand back yeah. and yeah, let my brother, this is my brother Eagle. Eagle actually, uh, did you say about talking? Or Eagle? Oh, I just said Eagle. Oh, okay. yeah. So, uh, so what I'm going to do is just uh, take a seat here as well, and and like Brother Tony said, uh, you know, start with honoring our heroes and our sheroes, our, our mothers and our fathers and our grandmas and grandfathers, and tell you how we got here. And so our, our story starts, um, as our old people say, Dolk, just so long ago, like so long ago, and that we, we descend from the sun, pieces of the sun, and we broke off from the sun and became stars. And, and today DNA can prove that, you know, that, that we're part of the stars, we're part of the earth, and that we traveled here through the Milky Way and got here to this, this earth where Kuksu and Marunda, the, the deities of this, this land, were here. And they placed us on the earth, and they placed us with everything that we needed, the fish, the birds, the trees, uh, the plants, the medicines, everything we needed was here. And we got brought here through that process. And so I like to start there because my son is gonna to go to school and learn that he descended from a monkey in evolution, an ape. And but that's a that's not the truth for our story. And and but if that's what science wants to teach, he has to learn that. But I want him to know our story, where we came from, how we got here. And so I want to talk about a time when there was there was no starvation. There was no such thing as houselessness. There was no such thing as mental health disparities. There was no suicide rates. There was none of those things that we had to encounter. And our job was just to be good human beings. And at that time, we weren't even Elem. We weren't even Koi. We were just the Mafo, the human beings. And that's how we saw each other. And then of course we fast forward, you know, uh, I'm gonna say this, that, that we can sit here for days before we get through all the 22,000 years that science will give us. And I'll say that we're all students of, of our history and, and we're all only a sophomore. Maybe, maybe Tony might be a junior, but we're only a sophomore <laughs> in our history. And some of us are freshmen, you know, and, and so that's okay. But this is a lifelong process and we want to acknowledge, like Brother said, the disparities, the hardships. All oppressed people have a lot in common. And we have to acknowledge that because people have been oppressed all over this earth. And we have to recognize that. And have the hard conversation about equity, 
about truth and reconciliation. But we can't do that until we tell the truth, until we speak the truth of what happened globally. And we understand today because we're educated in the school systems now. We can go and research and we understand that in the 1400s and 1500s, coming out of Rome, out of the Vatican, the papal bulls were written, which told Christian nations of Europe to go spread out over the earth and conquer all people, subdue all people. And out of that comes slavery, the slavery of our African relatives, the slavery of indigenous people globally. That's the beginning of that, that process. And then it arrived here with Columbus, that idea of colonization and capitalism. A man who was lost on the ocean and thought he landed in India and called us Indians. And, but that's not who we are. And so we have to acknowledge that that is still being told today. That incorrect history is still being told in schools today. And it's our job as the conscious ones to tell the truth so we can talk about equity, we can talk about reconciliation and that doesn't happen until we do the truth and if you're looking at the news you're starting to see today the residential schools in Canada where our babies are being dug up in the mass graves where today the Secretary of Interior Deb Holland has ordered that department to do a study of the federal boarding school system which took our children for 150 years in 1819 all the way to 1969 and took them from their families and told them that we're going to civilize you. Your ways are not good enough. They changed their names, they cut their hair, they stripped them of everything that they were as a human being. And they told them that we're not going to acknowledge you until you pick a Catholic name, you pick a Christian name, and then I'll, I'll acknowledge you. And so we have to start there because we can't reconcile something that wasn't good in the beginning. We have to have a conciliation. People have to hear what happened. You have to hear our grievances before we can have that equity and that truth and that reconciliation that's the buzzwords nowadays. Yes. Yes. We have to have that. And so when we look at our people here, 22,000 years, we look at the, the oldest, one of the oldest sites in Lake County, located in the town of Clear Lake today, where one of the first burials were unearthed in the early 1900s of a, of a Pomo relative who had all of his hunting implements, all the tools he needed to survive. And because we didn't control that story, they called him early man. They didn't credit us. They didn't acknowledge us. And that's still happening today. People tell me there's no racism, that they're not colorblind. But when I show up in the room, you have to see me. You have to acknowledge me. Because I can't change any of what I am. This is how my ancestors made me. And so when we look at that history, and we understand that there was a system in place that none of us created here, and a, a system that was created to impose and oppress. And that's what we're trying to break down. With the Columbuses, the Cortezes, the, the Sir Francis Drakes, the people who came to our shores, they had, they had one marching order. That was to go and claim the land for their countries and subjugate the people who were there. And so we look at that history of having peace for thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of years to now having a hell brought upon us. And that's the honest truth. That's the roots of our trauma. That's the roots of our hurt. And so until we peel back all of those layers the solutions that we come up with will never work until we understand what we're dealing with. And so the villages around Lake, there's more than a thousand villages in, in the what we call Pomo country, Lake Mendocino, Sonoma County. 
thousands of place names, thousands of sacred sites that today, because of, again, the removal and dispossession of our land that we're locked out of accessing to keep this world in balance, which is our job as the indigenous people here, to go to those lands, go to those waters, maintain the ceremonies to keep balance for the human beings because our creator understood that it was going to be us, the human beings, that put things out of balance. And it's happening. My grandma would say this to us and we would say, oh, grandma, you know, that's, that's that old folk storytelling. But it's the truth. It's the truth of what's going on today. We think about what came with the Spanish, the mission system, the system of forcibly again taking the indigenous people of California and forcibly taking them into the mission system and to forced religion because the Pope decreed that Christian nations have the right to do that. That we were not human beings, so we were there for the taking. You look at the, the Johnson versus McIntosh, one of the earliest court cases in the United States, a land court case of two European men who purchased the same land, one from indigenous people, one from a white land owning title, title who claimed the land. And what that court case established is that Indians don't have rights. They're like a fish in the water, a deer on the land, a bird that flies through the land. We cannot own the land. We can only travel on it. So the earliest Supreme Court decisions, the earliest rulings set the precedent for how we were to be treated. If we go to the Declaration of Independence, we look at King George and what he, he was asking and what the colonists, the 13 colonies were asking, that if we don't have independence, we're gonna fall to the merciless savage Indians. And that's still in the founding documents today. We look at our Declaration of Independence. We look at the Constitution, which excludes Indians and all other people are considered less than. That was the thinking of the people of that time, the ruling white majority men of that time. And so we have to acknowledge that. We have to come forward to the, the act for the government and protection of Indians in the 1850s that made it legal for white landowners to indenture and apprentice Indians. Slavery, legal slavery that went on here in California that doesn't make it into our history books. My last name Brown comes from Burn Brown, one of the first white men who came into Lake County. He settled the town of, if anybody's familiar with Clear Lake, the town of Burns Valley. My great, great, great grandmother lived there and became his property. And that's where my name comes from. We have that man's blood in our blood. And but at the time she was powerless to do anything, to say anything. And today we can talk about it. Before we had to stay quiet, we had to hush up. We couldn't say nothing. Following that, you have the gold rush. And if we look at the gold rush, it's all glory. Nothing about what happened to the people on the land. Nothing. No hardships. We hear about the first finding of gold and what a glorious thing it was, but we don't hear about the Indians who dug that gold. Tell us. We do not hear about them. How they were treated like hogs and fed like hogs by the people of that time. There's a conversation here in Lake County happening about the town of Kelseyville who did horrible things to our people. And you still have the pockets in Lake County, the old guard who says it's not okay to change that name. You have people with the mindset of that time who will tell you, I'm just as much native as you because my people have been here for six generations. And that's a mentality and mindset that we deal with today. Those are things we encounter. And we have to look at it. 
We have to talk about it because our kids come home hurt from school because the truth is not being told. And when they try to tell the truth, it's not in accordance with the curriculum, so we don't have that discussion. And so we have to look at all of those things. We have to look at the Dodge General Allotment Act, which took away the communal land holdings of all tribes in the United States and made us private landowners. Another act, again, to remove the land from us, dispossess us, and continue the policy of genocide. In the 1800s, the start with George Washington and the first 20 presidents of the United States, genocide policies to kill every Indian because we were a threat to manifest destiny. We were a threat. And because all of the treaties that were entered into agreement, more than 300 treaties which have all been broken by the federal government, says that as long as we exist as Indian people, the government has to provide health care, education, free of charge to Indian people. And But when you hear that today, Indians got a free ride on everything. Huh. Our ancestors paid in blood for those agreements, and they're still not being honored. We're still not being seen. Our stories are still not being told. And we continue to fast forward through that hurt, the loss without being able to deal with the grief and the hurt because you're constantly under attack. The southeastern Pomo people of, of Khoi and Kamdak in the 1880s joined in an amalgamation to live together. They abandoned their lands to find strength in numbers at 11 Khoiak Oaks. Because the reality was is you couldn't be shot and killed at that time just for being who you were. Not doing anything wrong. And it was okay. And that was done. And when you look at the history, sometimes it's written as uh, coyote killings. Killings of the coyotes to protect cattle. It's, it's masked and hidden. And so when we talk about the truth, when we talk about change, we have to be uncomfortable to listen, to hear. Because in that being uncomfortable, in that conflict, clarity comes. And that's the truth. We look at the public school system that we were locked out of. We looked at, at the citizenship that we were locked out of. Not until 1924 were some tribe people recognized as citizens. Many didn't get the right to vote until the Civil Rights Movement. That's not talked about. Mm. The public school systems who were, that were segregated here in Lake County that would march our, our Indian kids off to separate fountains and separate classrooms, but receiving government funds to build gymnasiums and infrastructure. And so when we look at this and we talk about this, these are some horrific things that have happened. I look at my grandmother who didn't know how to read, could write her name, and she told us about her experience in one of the schools, the Lake County Schoolhouse, which is a historic site, where abuse took place, where she was whipped and hit for talking her language. Here in this little Lake County that nobody wants to talk about. And so we have to acknowledge that. And so what did she tell my father? Just graduate high school. What did my father tell me? Just graduate high school. Maintain a small mindset because you've been locked out. You can't go any further. They couldn't contemplate us going to college because that was not their reality. They couldn't even get into the classroom in the public school. And so those are the things that have gone on. You look at the American Indian Religious Freedom Act in 1978 that was Pass, which gave indigenous people the right to practice their culture and ceremonies. 1978, on a land that was supposedly founded on religious freedoms. 1978, we were still going to jail for trying to maintain our cultural values and norms. 
There's a story of those elders who went to prison, who were sent away because they maintained their cultural values and norms. We look at all of the acts that were created to dispossess us, and they're all there for the research. If you take the time to look at all of those federal acts that were enacted by the federal government and then the state governments with the goal of dispossession. And today, tribes own less than 2 million acres of land here in California. The 18 unratified treaties of California set aside more than 10 million acres of land the entire Lake County Basin for the Pomo people. But what did the settlers do when they found out? They ran to Sacramento and said, these Indians don't know how to use this land. They don't know how to make anything out of this land. They don't deserve it. And then the treaties came about and we were put on these little 50 acre rancherias and reservations that we reside on today. We look at some of the disparities in education. We look at some of the disparities in just being a business person. And how many people have to pay one quarter out of every dollar that they make to the government? Tribes do with their gaming operations. Because everybody wants a piece. As Soon as we get a little something, somebody wants a piece of it because the mentality is you're not worthy enough to have that. I shared this story recently of trying to gather, you know, I just shared this story, trying to gather medicinal medicines off the land. And a gentleman stopped his car and came up to me and asked, what are you doing? And I said, I'm, I'm here coming to this place. My people have come here for hundreds of years to gather. And he told me, there's no Indians here. There's never been Indians on this land. With the mentality that he's the mighty landlord and can tell me, that I'm not here. And he sees me. We're in a conversation. That you guys were never here. And that idea and mentality is here today in Lake County. Still here. Not as prevalent as it was. But in small pockets. We have the Bloody Island Massacre that took place. Just had a ceremony this past weekend to acknowledge our ancestors that were, that were murdered there that didn't do anything wrong, that were in the wrong place at the wrong time. And because two white men were killed who were enslaving our people, the cavalry came and they, they killed, killed a whole village of people. More than 300 people, women and children, and some young men and old men, right down the road from here. And that happened. And we're just now being able to say, we want to have a ceremony to heal we want to have a ceremony to grieve, to cry, to start to process what our grandmothers and grandfathers couldn't. And so their bodies were just thrown in the pit. No ceremony, no song, nothing for them. And we're trying to do that today. And so when we talk about history, we talk about equity, we have to talk about what happened, what went on here. Not to point blame or point the fingers, but to simply acknowledge that it happened. Because with acknowledgement comes healing for us. With acknowledgement comes those tears that our ancestors couldn't cry. With acknowledgement begins a process for us to say, yeah, everything our ancestors prayed for is happening today. I'm going to, I want to end with uh, one, one story, and, and this story is, is before the time of uh, European contact, and it's a story of the wisdom keepers, and they said how that, that uh, people were coming, and they were going to bring four things to destroy our community, and one of those things was a black book, one was a song, one was a liquid, and one was a card, and we know that today to be the Bible. We know that song to be the national anthem. We know that liquid to be alcohol. And we know that card to be a tribal enrollment card. Our ancestors told us this. And so now what do we do? 
Where do we go? How do we help each other? How do we put our circle back into balance? How do we put this land back into balance? Because our lake out there is dying. When you go and look at Clear Lake, it's dying. Because of what's being done to it for economic gain. What's been done to it with the legacy of mining here in Lake County. We live next to the Superfund site, the Sulphur Bank Superfund site, a toxic site where mercury was mined, quicksilver, everything from bomb making materials was mined right next door to our land. And as a result, our ancestors are dying from the highest rates of cancer here in Lake County. But all the USA EPA wants to do is clean it up just a little bit enough to not make it an eyesore for the people coming in their boats to fish here. Not address the quality of water or the quality of life, but to have economics above the quality of health of the people. And being locked out of that conversation is a struggle. And so these are the things that we deal with today, currently. Suspension rates, expulsion rates, with not having opportunities. We deal with the missing and murdered indigenous women epidemic. We're dealing with so many things that we have to have all of our people working together to try to address it. And still it's barely known. Still there's little acknowledgement. In 2018, when Donald Trump took office, the United States Commission on Civil Rights enacted a report called Broken Treaties. And I would encourage you to look at that report. And that report outlines all of the disparities that indigenous communities are facing because of the shortfall in funding that has been promised to them. And those are the experts in D.C. who put that together. The U.S. Commission on Civil Rights, Broken Promises, and it'll outline everything I'm telling you right now. And if you want to fact check it, the information is there, and I encourage you to not believe what I'm saying, but go and do the research yourself and find that truth so we can find solutions. And like I said, we can go on and on for days and days about our history, but I'll leave it there because I can speak for hours and hours. <laughs> and But I want to respectfully reserve time for my brothers and sisters here to share, to also provoke some thoughts and some next steps. Where do we go? What do we do? Because we can put it out on the table. Now it has to be dealt with. And so I'll hand it over to, to Shea next. Thank you. too much because he took all our material <laughs> <laughs> everything and I would just sit here for a little bit <laughs> yeah <laughs> um, what I want to um, just briefly uh, highlight is that um, I was born uh, March 2nd 1978 and so what's signi significant about that year is that on August 11th 1978 was the was when the in um, the Indian Religious Freedom Act was actually signed. And so had my parents had a ceremony for me, um, for my birth, uh, for my first laugh, or whatever, whatever it may be, it would have been considered illegal to do that. And so I was fortunate that, that a majority of my life I was uh, given permission to uh, practice my ceremonies, sing my songs, uh, to do our dances, and, and everything that's considered and falls under that act. Because prior to that, it was considered illegal. To be essentially who we were, to speak our languages, 
to practice our ceremonies. A lot of times what you'll see is like in, in, in some of these um, ceremonial houses, there's round houses, is in, 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 and I've heard these stories is, is that the way they kind of got around that in order to practice their ceremonies is they would put crosses on the house so they would be left alone. But a lot, a lot of those things still exist today. And so um, the second thing I want to highlight is I want to honor and acknowledge my dad. His name is uh, Clayton Duncan, and, and a lot of you, uh, the locals probably know who he is or heard about him. He has a radio show. He's advocated for Native rights um, for a long time. He was a big part of um, changing the mascot in uh, Kelseyville. And, and, and my dad was not, you know, raised in formal education. He dropped out in ninth grade. But the thing about my dad is he was given a story. He was given a story of survival that was tied to the Bloody Island Massacre, May 11th, 1850. And so he took that story and the obligation and the commitment that came with it. And I remember um, a man saying, once you know the truth, you're responsible for it. So what does that actually mean? So as a young person, he heard the truth and he took that responsibility and he went with it and he told the story. You know, and it was with, you know, uh, against um, people who didn't like to hear the story or didn't want to hear the story. And so briefly going over the story, um, a man by the name of Andrew Kelsey and uh, Charles Stone, they occupied, uh, occupied the area of what's known as uh, Kelseyville right now. And so they used a lot of the uh, local tribes, Big Valley, uh, those along the lake for um, indentured servitude uh, to work the mines in the gold rush. And uh, some of the more uh, darker secrets have to do with molestation of young native uh, girls and requesting the company of those young native girls. And, and if that request wasn't uh, fulfilled, then, then they would hang the um, parents by their wrists from a tree. And so that's just one example. And so for a long time, the mascot of that town, the school's mascot, was the Kelseyville Indians. And so my dad, given that story, just common sense, hey, that's disrespectful. Given who the man was and how he treated the community, how he treated the native population of that time, it's disrespectful for you to associate him with the tribal people of this area. And so he spoke up and he advocated for years and years and it took a long time. I'm not exactly sure how long, but it took a long time um, meetings and school board meetings until finally it was acknowledged and one half of the room was uh, for it, one half of the room was against it. And for me it was very difficult because we had tribal people that were against it as well which is our reality. You know, our, our tribal communities are so diverse nowadays. You know, you, you have uh, different levels of assimilation, you have those that practice uh, ceremony and culture, and you have those that um, um, practice organized religion. So diverse. You know, there, there, there are those who look like um, a lot of us, there are some who are lighter, and there are, <laughs> there are those who you can't really tell. And so, so he advocated and he advocated until um, there was a school, uh, a school board who listened to what he had to say, who listened to the comments and all of the, the things and they voted uh, to change it. Because they seen the need, they, they seen the importance of it. And so, and, and there's presently a group who's trying to take it further to change the, uh, the name of the town. And personally, I'm for it because I understand the history. And I understand that it's not okay to honor a molester, an abuser. It's not okay. I understand that. And so he just got done um, doing, I think it was like the 28th annual, 29th annual sunrise ceremony. And so a big... Um, 
a part of a part of it was the mascot changing the mascot name and, and another part was honoring the story because our story is a uh, Lucy Moore who was six years old survived the Bloody Island Massacre of 1850 on the island the, the, uh, there was a game that they used to play where, where they would breathe through a tule reed and, and they would hide in the tules and you couldn't find this young child in the um, in the water and so when when the massacre started to happen that's what her uh, her mother told her to do go hide in the tules and, and so she survived that at six years old and so she's the reason I'm here today and I'm able to share the story with you today is because of her and her sacrifice and what she had to do. And so my dad, he honors that, that time, that survival. He doesn't honor the massacre and what happened. He tells the story and because and he, you know, his responsibility to the truth is to continue to tell that story. And so he just had, I think it's the 28th, 29th annual. It, it, it's been a long time. And what's interesting is that Rose is the one that, uh, kind of planted that seed because he's like, hey, I want to do this honoring and stuff like that. And she's like, why not a candlelight vigil? And so that's where it started. And he's been doing it ever since. And my dad, he's um, survived cancer. And, and he has health issues, but he makes sure every year he has this honoring for that specific story. And I commend him for that. And uh, I want to just um, share that um, just this past um, November, and I want to thank uh, Katie and Zach for really advocating and for pushing us to um, do Native uh, presentations for Native American Heri uh, Heritage Month at the Kelseyville School. And I want to acknowledge the, the superintendent of schools and those that supported us going into that community and educating the youth on some of the topics, but, but we make sure to be appropriate. We know a lot of the information that um, Eagle shared is not appropriate for the younger ages. You know, we could, we could share a little bit more uh, with the high schoolers and things like that, but this is probably one of the first opportunities that we had to actually go into the schools and share some of our experience and history, given the trauma that happened, given the mascot change and the trauma that came with that, it was the first opportunity to do that. And it made me realize the amount of work that actually needs to be done. Because we, although we did share some stories, there were some of the youth who came up after and they thanked us for sharing a little bit. You know, and, it, and, and that's when we're talking about wellness and moving forward in a good way, it's creating those opportunities for wellness to occur. And so I'm thankful because uh, Lake County is very unique. You know, there's, there's, there's two um, Board of Supervisors who come from the tribal communities. And I think it's the only county in the whole nation that has that. But, but they have that here. There's been a lot of advocacy, there's been a lot of work done on behalf of the Native communities, and although it's been a struggle, although there's, you know, obstacles along the way, there's a lot of good work being done. And there's a lot of growth. And it's important, and uh, share a little bit about my Navajo side, um, and what's considered like the beauty way. It, it's, it's the idea that beauty surrounds us at all times. It's in everything, it's in everyone, but you have to be able to see it. Yeah, we can talk about all the bad things that happen, but in any situation, in any occurrence, there's beauty. And it's important that at all times that we see that, that even though we uh, share these stories of hurt and trauma that can trigger people, that can make you feel uncomfortable, the beauty's here, regardless if we see it or not. And so it's important that we train ourselves to be able to see the beauty that's there. Oh. So uh, I just have to say, you know, um, uh, it you listen, listen to my brother speak, you know, it touched. Uh, I started feeling anxiety. You know, uh, did you feel a little anxiety, like a little anxious, like, uh oh, like he's getting too deep. Like, it's supposed to be a happy thing, right? We're it's like a happy day. And, 
and, and it was getting deep. And that's our ancestors nudging us, right? That's the work of our ancestors. You know, in our way, we are the answered prayer of seven generations ago, right? And I heard ancestors today that we are ancestors to our descendants. And so what we say and pray and do today will affect them down the road. And you know, what we do together, none of us can do on our own. Well, that's when I heard that, the hair stood up on my, my arm because those are the teachings of our resiliency. See, our teachings of past before contact before I had to show an, an, you an ID of who I am, <laughs> right? I don't have a card to prove that I'm Irish. Do I need one? I do need one to show that I'm Native American to come back in from Tijuana. So our teachings aren't similar to the way this United States of America was formed. We don't have a king or a president and then you have all the other people and you know the government people and then you have and then we're way down here right all of us if you're not in white house right now or if you didn't fly in on a private jet then you're probably down here with me <laughs> our teachings are different and the reason i'm bringing this up is because resiliency in our world is real because I heard a beautiful story about the Kelseyville and the survival and the resiliency that young six-year-old well I have a story that's similar my great-great-grandfather his name is Samatsin and he was right here in Lower Lake he was recruited 200 young Native American boys by the Kelseyville Stone gold mining expedition was taken over to the foothills of Sacramento those two men and their little helpers got sick and what they do they left all those Native American boys over there and came back barely surviving surviving themselves those boys had to venture out and try to get back here two of them made it the rest of them left, they got abandoned, they died, they got killed, they starved. Two of them made it. One of them was Samatsin, my great-great-grandfather, who ended up having children of his own, and they had children, and they had children. My great-grandfather was born here in Lake County, right down the street where I live, in 1858 his son and so that story of resiliency we all have them it, every one of us does have some sort of resiliency and so our teachings aren't about the pyramid there's no head honcho in our village there's nobody that knows more than that's why we put our women up front our women are connected to the spirit our women are spiritual beautiful people that bring life into the world so our teaching is is that if we were if we were in charge of this little meeting right now we're here sharing but we would have a circle we would have a circle because in our teachings everyone's equal we're equal there's no big honcho and no boss man no woman we're all equal and when we want to come in our old ways, when there was an issue, and my great grandfather taught me this, when there's an issue with the family, we go to the people. We go to the family. If I want to do something, I have to go to the family. I have to go to the council. I have to go to the people and we discuss it. They share their wisdom. And I usually have to listen to them. So those teachings, is what kept this place beautiful for thousands of years. Respect for the land. 
respect for this place. Respect. When we travel somewhere, we always want to know where we're traveling to and the people that are from there because they have the connection. It don't matter where, whether it's Hawaii, New Zealand, Europe. I took a trip, took my mom back to her homeland over in Ireland and I I or, uh, uh, to Italy. And the first thing we did when we got off the boat or the plane was we acknowledged the land. Acknowledging the land. And those teachings are important because my grandmother used to, and don't get, uh, well, get offended. <laughs> my grandmother, when she'd laugh about my mom, because my mom was, uh, she'd call her, you know, the Kale, Kale, the Masan, you know, the white woman. But my mom was probably, she was down, I mean, she was ghetto. My mom was heck, and she still is, you know, 74 years old, and she's like, she's that woman. And uh, she would teach her and say, you know what? It's okay, babe. You're all right. I know you were born in Palo Alto and your family's from Idaho and they came over on a boat. It's okay because you are disconnected with your land. See, in our way, when you're disconnected to your land, it's like taking your mother away from you. And imagine if, I don't know if you're orphaned or if you, you were adopted or you have that empty hole in your heart and your spirit. And so in our language, hoko yakota, hoko yakota is a person with no mother, no family. And so when you take, you take the, that's the first thing they did in the boarding schools. The first thing they did was take the babies away from their land, way far away, and take the babies from their mother and their father. That evil spirit knew what they were doing. And I'm not blaming a race. It's a spirit. And so that, when you, when you took people away from their land, I was talking to brothers yesterday about the Ubuntu. That African Ubuntu about what we do together is true. When you take a family or you take a people away from their land, they're orphans. And you can take their culture, you can take their language, you can take their identity, and you can take their beliefs away. And so breaking that down is is that first uh, oh, act of genocide. Then you can control the people. And so what's the solution, right? And I'm gonna end with this. The solution is having this conversation, right? It's starting to begin to have the conversation and then learning that love can heal all things. And so, we invite you into our circle. Yes. We invite you to have that tough conversation and that, that healing so that we can begin to heal as well. Because if you heal, then we heal. And if we heal, you heal. Because if you're ancestors of slavery or ancestors of slavery or ancestors of enslaving others, then you're just as oppressed as we were. <laughs> You're just as hurt as we are. Yes. Because you have to deal with that every day, waking up, knowing where you didn't come from or where you came from. Yeah. And so we're in this together. Yes. Right? Let's open the dialogue and let's heal together. Okay. I'm going to pass this on to my wife because she's like that soft, beautiful, warm <laughs> spirit. That no matter if she's cussing you out, you love it. Like, you know. <laughs> So I, I just I just say, you know, it's an honor to be here in this water, in the sun. Just remember, wherever you go, there you are, and your people, and you represent those ancestors that we talked about. And so that's our teaching. Wherever we go, we represent our ancestors. And it's really helped me out. It's really helped me out in my walk. And I wish I could tell you all about it. Maybe these next few days we'll sit down and talk. And I'll tell you some of the the resiliency that I've lived, that, that we've lived.
So. Thank you. Thank you, children. So I just, you know, want to share a few words that uh, we're almost done. And, and um, you know, I just want you know, to thank you all for, for hearing. Hearing what was said, feeling what was said, seeing what was said. And, um, you know, when, when we talk about being mindful, being good to each other, um, you know, we're, we're a, a part of that legacy, me and my brother, of Bloody Island after, you know, they call it Bloody Island because there was blood full around the island. And they left here and went to Mendocino County where our mother's from. And the, the river ran with blood. And so we're a part of that. So we all have those stories, right? We have the stories of re resiliency. And we don't get to share them in school. We don't get to share them in fifth grade and, and when they're talking about the missions. We don't get to share our story because um, it's not taught in higher education. It's not talked about. And so this is a huge part of that conversation that our kids are sitting in school talking about. They're, they're studying on the land that was theirs, but they don't get to tell their story. So thank you for hearing this story and know that there are stories on the land that you reside on and that you come from. And, and the spiritual part of that, you know, we, we all speak here because our, our parents, our uncle, our grandparents shared this with us. This was our other education at home. You know, we have our traditions because somebody hid them. Somebody hid them and didn't talk about them, but shared them underground so that we could dance and we could speak language you know, we're relearning our language, you know, but to graduate from high school or college, I need a foreign language, and I'm speaking English, but I need a foreign language, <laughs> you know. I walk into rooms, and, and, you know, I look at the good. That's what we were taught, to look at the good. And part of that is loving this land. You know, we all work for tribes because that's, that's the future of our people that are unborn right now. You know, we work for tribes because we love our people. We love them. I can't work at McDonald's. I can't work for the county. It's so hard because I'm always explaining who I am and where I come from. And so when I work for my own tribal community, I can say, you know, these are the stories. This is why we're still here, to share these beautiful stories of, of resiliency, of making it here and continuing, you know. And, and I just, you know, I, I brought some baskets and... Um, materials um, not just to talk about the tapestry but to let you know that we have our own ways you know prior to the flour and the meat you know we 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 gathered our own food that creator provided for us we gathered our acorns we, we you know we gathered it with prayers with our family and we were thankful and today we can't gather as much because it's on private property Today we, we um, you know we make our baskets that our babies are born in, and in the hospital still today we don't bring them. We take our kids home in these car seats, and then there's a playpen and a crib, and we have a baby basket that we took care of our young in for you know for generations that was made from the willow that came from this ground, and today Caltrans will still cut it across and not understand and ask us what are you guys out here doing as we're cutting materials to make baskets and, and i tell my husband you know let's just wear some some reflective vests the leave we're doing community service <laughs> and it works they leave us alone because they think we're doing community service and and that's the resiliency factor right let's do what we can to preserve like our ancestors did let's figure out and that's that love that tony talks about you know tony wants to share what we're doing and i just want to gather in peace you know we go to the ocean to gather seaweed and somebody just like when my brother wants to know what are you people doing and tony loves to share we're doing the work of our ancestors and i am like you know, I do love people, but I don't bother you when you're in church praying. I don't ask you, what are you doing? I don't, but still people continue to walk up and say, what are you guys doing? And, and so it just, you know, and I'm learning. I learn from that. I, I, you know, my understanding, we were raised with that love for our people, that love for our culture, you know. And, and so I, I bring the materials here to share that we make these out of love. You know, we, we don't make anything if we're not feeling good. <laughs> if we, we don't have those prayers, the acorn mush, when you eat it, 
we have some for you to, to, um, to eat if you'd like to try it. But it's made with love, gathered with love, dried with love, cracked with love of our ancestors that came before us, that gathered in the same places that we gather today. And so the, the little bit that I want to share, you know, is that change, intervention, um, happens here in your heart, not in your head. It happens here. You give what you have. And this is the greatest gift. We all have love, right? We all are connected. I, I always share, you know, when I, when I speak and I share about the culture, someone sits in the room and says, you know, I think I heard we might be Native. I think, but I don't want to ask because that's a dumb question. And it's not because of what we shared with you. All the policies, colonization, it wasn't favorable to be Native. And, and I don't say American because I was here, bef I was Native before America came. And so I share that, no disrespect. But I was here, you know, I'm as native as the plant that grows here. And so I say that when my husband introduces himself, you know, he's shared his native name. I don't, I don't share that in all these spaces. I share my government name, Rose Steele. <laughs> That's my government name. And I have a piece of paper and a social security card and a tribal ID to sh share who I am. You know, a pedigree, like an animal, that I'm this much native. You know, it doesn't matter how much you have, but we're still being documented on what we are. Are you a quarter? Are you a fourth? To get services, my kids have to be a certain amount, so I have to marry someone native, so they're still native. And and it's easier, too, because then you have to talk about <laughs> you know, using the baskets and the acorn mush, and, and it, it's always explaining who we are. And with other tribes, you know, we're, we all come from different places, and we all do, like Eagle shared about the brown, we do have that legacy we have that name but our grandmother taught us to share what we have to share our culture to love it and you know with love you know anything is possible and you know i just like i said i'm thankful for um justin and marvin and katie and you know all the work all the work that we've done um you know a, a part of coming here and our taking our time to be here is um you know we we say adomstis and that's love. A dome sith me doesn't mean I, I just love you. It means I love your ancestors. I love your family. I love everything about you. That's the connection. I don't love my car. I can't take that with me. I don't love any personal belongings that, you know, when it's when we're evacuating for fires here in this county, you know, we, we can leave because you know we we've lost a lot already. And sometimes we'll pack our feathers and our singing sticks and, and these baskets, but no property, no pictures, no TV. You know, we, we take what means so much to us, but we are resilient and we've learned we can recreate again. And so thank you. Thank you all for, for being here and taking the time to hear what's being said. Um, you know, it's very much appreciated and we look forward to talking more throughout this this uh, couple of days we do have a ceremony we're supposed to be at on on the night on thursday so a few of us may be here um but you know let's continue this conversation and, and thank you for your attention and, and your time and and not getting up and leaving and, and even you might have to go to the restroom you still waited because you, you don't know you know and and that's okay you know we're we're all here to share and um and thank you I know we've been up here for a long time, so I just want to share uh, a couple of different stories real quick with you guys. Um, my my father, uh, I asked him once when I was young. I said, "Dad, how come we don't practice the culture and the ceremony?" And he go and he told me the story. We we're living on the Coyote Valley Reservation in a in a trailer with no water and no electricity, and he was teaching me chess with marbles and checkers and missing pieces by candlelight. I was five, and I asked him that question, and he says, uh, "I was a child of boarding school." He goes, when I was a young child, the church came with, with the government, uh, with, the, with the BIA officials came and they took us, your, your, uh, your dad and uh, your, grandma, your grandma and your grandpa, they, they couldn't, they, the police came and they held them back while they took uh, my brothers and my sisters with them. And they said they cut our hair and they, they beat us for just speaking our language. And he goes, so when we, we ran away, they'd always take us back and they'd beat us. And he goes, so when we finally got back with, with your grandma and your grandpa, <clears throat> 
it, it had been ingrained in us that if we if we speak our language and if we practice our culture that we'll be taken away again and so we didn't want to be taken away again so we we stopped and he goes and it was it was always we always knew that we were Indian and we knew it was meant to be Indian and he goes but we didn't that culture was taken away from us and he goes I don't have it to give you because it was taken from me and and so when I, I sit up here and I have the honor to sit up here with with my family members up here with Kate these are all people that I learned from. They were talking about their sophomores. I'm, I'm still just a child when it comes to culture. Um, and, you know, my dad said in order for you to be successful, you ha unfortunately, you have to go into the white world and you have to learn how to be successful there. He goes, we don't have the skills necessary to be successful here. A lot of us have, have been that taken away. We've been oppressed. We've been beaten down. He goes, so you need to go to college and you need to learn those skills and bring them back to us. And so I left for, at 17. I left for 17 and started a family. I went to school, I was a 19 year old father, um, and we figured it out. And I lived in met huge cities, I lived in Sacramento, I lived in Bay Area, I worked in Oakland and San Francisco, we moved in LA. And after 15 years, I finally got to come home. Oh, and, I, and I got to come home and I got to bring everything that I learned on how to be successful in the white world so that I could come here and help our people. And, and so I, I'm, I'm here learning from all of these individuals up here every single day. Everything that they say up here, I take as, as like I'm in church right now, like I'm learning, because this is who, these are my these are my practitioners. These are the ones that I look up to. These are my elders, um, and I and I look at them. And so I might be the leader on, on an organization for social services, but it's because I learned how to walk in that world and how to unite the two. But I still come home and I still have to learn how to how to be where I'm from and who my people are. And so I thank everybody here. I thank Katie. And I thank I thank every single one of these individuals up here because these are the people that I look up to. These are my heroes. Some people have baseball cards. These are these are my these are my heroes. You know? And so I just want to thank you guys for having us here today, um, because what what's really going to be uh, the, the outcome that I'm looking for is how we can work better together and how we can move forward as one. And so it's important that you guys know this background, that you guys know this history, because we, now we're sitting at the table as equals and we can move forward and have positive outcomes to move forward to in the future so that when, when our children our grandchildren are looking back, what did we do, what did you accomplish? We can say this is what we were able to do because we all moved as one. <clears throat> so thank you guys for listening to our stories and I appreciate you guys and look forward to working with you over the next couple of days. <laughs> spent and yeah. I'm going to do this to Justin now. And you make it up as you go along. Yeah, that's what I do sometimes. That's right. Hi, uh, my name is Justin Daddy. I'm the project manager of Philip Rising. Uh, let me just make a couple of adjustments, but before we do that, I just want to give thanks. Um, thank you for all of you being here. Uh, thank you for the stories that were shared. For me, I grew up in Lower Lake. I'm from this area, but for the first time, I learned the history of our area, and that was very, very, very special to me. Um, and to be able to share that and those stories, and I, I just want to make sure that our tribal community understands and knows that those stories, the time, the energy, the love has not been wasted. And these conversations are going to be great that we're going to have this week. It, can, it cannot just be all that we do. It has to be the start of the conversations moving forward. So for that, I give thanks and, and thank you for your time. Um, but this cannot just be what we do. It has to be more than that. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to take a little bit of a break, but we're going to pass it off to Christina. She's going to give you some expectations, talk a little bit about it. We're going from there and look forward to talking to all of you as the week goes on.